Hello. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the conference The Future of Europe. Zukunft Deutscher Film, Zukunft Europa. We are very happy to uh, meet uh, one of the best and most interesting and younger directors of the European cinema, Albert Serra. And uh, masterclass means that we will have a kind of a deep focused Q&A on uh, your films and on ideas of Europe in your films. And uh, let's say after 30 or 40 minutes, uh, you may join us with your questions and remarks and even criticism if necessary. We have uh, one hour time. So, and there is for all those who have, I say it in German, wer noch nicht mitbekommen hat, dass es eine simultane Übersetzung gibt, der kann sich noch die entsprechenden uh, Headsets holen und Fragen natürlich auch nachher auf Deutsch stellen. So, well, Albert, welcome to Frankfurt. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, with your last uh, film, uh, Pacifiction, of course, which was shown in Germany, as most of your films, not just in festivals, but in distribution, uh, you, you tell a story which is quite actual political and which is about Europe, even when it's in the Pacifics, set in the Pacifics, and it's as well kind of longing, European longing. Uh, hopefully many of you have seen this film. But as well, it, it seemed to me in preparation for this meeting that all your films are kind of dealing with European cultural history and with uh, myths not just with, uh, of course, with reality, but with the reality of myths. So you did a film on a biblical topic, you did a film on Don Quixote, you did a film on uh, monarchy, uh, Casanova, uh, all that. Um, are you in any way aware of that? Are you interested in a topic of Europe, of European uh, myth, and of, of this line which those films have in common? Or is each film for you quite unique, individual, and not connected to all the others? I mean, um, I think at the level, uh, good morning, I think at the level of content, it's not uh, directly linked, because any film has a, you know, an origin, a totally different origin, and sometimes, you know, it comes to me, not decided by me, but the people around, or I don't know, crazy ideas. So I think that on the level of a strict content of everything, uh, it's more chance that brings all these subjects. But the idea of, you know, making cinema inside Europe and dealing with the conditions, maybe not the strictly the content, but the conditions of, of doing cinema here, I think that, yes, it's, uh, it's quite uh, important. And, you know, I, I like it very much because conditions are the best in the world by far. Because if you go to Anglo-Saxon countries, you know, there is not even public money anywhere. So you see all the, most of the films coming from these countries are, you know, almost, uh, we could say, uh, not very good or very bad even. And they are even destroying the industry of independent cinema. So I don't see any, any interest in going to these countries. And then, of course, there are all other countries in the world, but nobody has a structure, you know, a frame where you can develop uh, ideas and a specifically formal ideas of the development of the evolution of cinema from formal point of view, like in Europe. And okay, everything looks like everything it, it's allowed no? here because, uh, well, you have a lot of public money everywhere. Nobody cares or nobody care in the past about what you were doing. Now it looks like that people is caring more, not in the good sense. Uh, but uh, okay, still, I think there is so, some freedom. And this is the context where I live psychologically. So I want to profit of that, and then any idea that can come to my mind can be real because it's Europe. So when perfect you, conditions. When you are in the in other, you are working with producers in France, in Germany, with uh, television stations in diff several European or EU countries. I don't know about Switzerland and Great Britain as well. You worked with no, them? never. No, no. So it's a European Union as well. But when you come, let's say, to a city like Frankfurt, on the one hand, it's a foreign country. You don't speak the German language. You've never been in Frankfurt before. On the other hand. 
50 meters far is the old Tat, the Theater am Turm, where Fassbender, one of uh, the important names for your filmmaking, did theater for years. So uh, one could say maybe it's kind of coming home. Do you feel when you travel to several countries and cities in the EU, do you feel like it's one country? Do you feel at home? Yes, absolutely. And especially because all these filmmakers that somehow influence not only me, but I think everybody, uh, that now they are landmarks of creation in the 20th century. I mean, they were, it was only possible here because they were so critical and so, uh, so I don't know, contradictory sometimes, so crazy that, uh, you know, it's part of our heritage in this old Europe that is hypocritical against uh, itself, no? And this is the only place in the world, again, that you can be so critical and still be alive. You know, in any other country, you will not be, you know, will not have any public space, and we see it constantly nowadays in all countries. You know that uh, this kind of freedom, artistic freedom, is going on on great regression everywhere. You know, if it's not on the pressure of the economically, like in the Anglo-Saxon countries, it's on the pressure on politics in more dictator focus, <laughs> focus or dictator rule countries. But uh, you know, still here on everybody. It's a little bit a paradox because nowadays, you know, I find a lot of people that they say, uh, okay, and they praise Fassbinder and they praise, I don't know, uh, you know, Fassbinder that was also was criticized by the right wing, by the left wing, by everybody. Uh, or I don't know, Pasolini, you know, that today will be unacceptable, you know, because he was, uh, well, dealing with, you know, his homosexuality and the way he was. You know, also, you know, having yeah, and violence, yeah, and relationships and violence and all this kind of thing that, and it's the same people, you know, so I don't understand exactly which is the position because everybody wants to, you know, value this freedom, but on practical terms, it's, it's reducing and, and puts a lot of people in cultural levels in contradiction. I see this even more, you know, more, diff, you know, more crazy way in theater. You know, for the reason I started to forget and I'm not being interested in theater anymore. Because, you know, mostly, of course, the great theaters are public theaters and, uh, you know, you cannot uh, talk about anything uh, nowadays in theater. So, uh, I don't know. I think that I see, see contradictions or I see a lot of people that don't feel comfortable. In, in, in Europe of, you know, giving total freedom to artists because, well, today it's more controversial what this freedom means. And we see the example, the perfect example here in Germany with this, uh, the, the Israel and Palestinian, you know, that put in Berlin Alley, I was jury there and I saw all the, you know, all these contradictions or in Las Documenta, yeah. you know, in Germany also. Germany maybe is the most extreme extreme country in Europe nowadays where this, uh, where this uh, contradiction happens in the heart of cultural industry, yeah. not only because of these political subjects of the, of the Israel, but some others too. No, so Culture is a battlefield. Kind sorry? Of. Culture is a battlefield. Yes, yes, but it could be a battlefield, but not for censorship. I mean, there is already a lot of self-censorship because as you live in this dangerous environment, uh, you know, you yourself, you are already, you know, taking, you know, being aware of what you can do or what you cannot do. And sometimes, okay, it can be good because you find new ideas or new, uh, you find new ways of saying things or, you know, can stimulate your imagination. But for the people that it's not very politically involved, like me, that only have, you know, very simple principles of freedom of expression, especially in arts, that I really care about, but uh, I am not, you know, interested in a lot of social problems or whatever. Uh, I think, uh, you know, this is a little bit, because I don't, I don't need to find new intelligent or new imaginative ways of, of saying things, because in fact I don't have anything, I don't have any idea, I don't have anything to say. I work with form of cinema, but there is nothing behind. I mean, I don't have any point of view of anything. And this is, I think, this kind of innocence. I think it's the, the nowadays, it's the, the, the perfect attitude with the new technologies of uh, digital cinema and digital technology to really create images that are still mysterious, that are still intriguing, that, you know, where the meaning of the images is, is floating and it's, you know, it's still alive. That is not dead meanings or you want just to, you know, pass a message of what you think about life. 
I mean, what I think about life or about, I don't know, about friendship or about immigration or about whatever, it, it has no interest, it has no point. I am, you know, stupid. So, I mean, it's not, it's not, I don't think I never develop any intelligent, I never spend my time developing intelligent opinions about that. So I concentrate a lot and I spend a lot of time, you know, working with the form of cinema, but never having, you know, interesting opinions about other things. Yeah, well, we, I, I think... Inevitably, sorry. Inevitably, when you make cinema, because you deal with a lot of people, you know, because uh, it's, a, it's a crew and you are in a space and digital cameras are very sensitive and I always have the theory that digital cameras capture things that are not visible to human eyes, you know, then, of course, all these problems around that I never lose time on thinking about somehow infiltrates the, the eye of the camera and are there, and I think, modestly, in a more interesting way that you have, if you have previous ideas. Well, we have, uh, we, we have in common... And I force myself of not having ideas, sorry. I force myself, yes. you know, it's part of this idea of keeping innocence alive, forcing myself how to weigh the, the, how to, you know, put pressure on myself of not really, not having any idea of anything. Well, I, I think you have many ideas and you have a lot to say uh, in, in your films, but you say it in a different way, not as a message movie, of course. And when you look at the films in this festival, and I think the taste of uh, most of our audience is not about uh, message movies, that we love those. But um, on the other hand, in, in your films, let's take uh, Don Quixote or the, the Bible, the, the Three Kings film. You're referring to very classical stories, almost myths, which, uh, and there are many adaptations of this story in different ways, in different times. So in a way, you refer to something like a canon of European thought, of uh, European ideas, or even Occidental ideas, Abendland in uh, German. Um, do you think that these ideas are still alive, are still a paradigm? for young audience, or do you think it's almost something for the museum and for the happy few? Uh, it's, uh, well, nowadays everything is interesting, it's already for the happy few, so I think cinema is not an exception. You know, I talk about theater, you know, I think theater it's, it's really having difficult times at, from creative point of view, and you know, it can be worse. I mean, cinema there are, there are still some freedom, just because one thing that it's that you make the film with your own people and the film will be shown two years after. So there is no connection with the audience. There is no, no people, you know, don't care. And with theater, no, you have the audience there every day and it's like, you know, the, the, uh, the internet. You need the applause every day and, you know, and I don't know, there is a pressure on that. And theater is dead because of that because people cannot accept anymore not having not being successful or being, you know, criticized in this world for saying something that, you know, has people that do not agree. People cannot almost nowadays, and to see this, you know, in real time, every night, can, people cannot have the, 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 the force to, to hold that. So I, I see that all theater pieces are just to please the audience, are just there to please the audience. There is not even one single piece uh, the audience, of course, that is going to the theater and paying the ticket, that it's a specific audience, it's not, you know. But, uh, but cinema, uh, you know, it's, it's different, it's more chaotic, and you can use everything you say about Europe, okay, because it's iconic, you know, you play with images, and you play with subjects that have been there all over the, you know, you see history of painting, no, some, some subject of history of painting, of course, linked with religion and Christianity and whatever has been there for centuries. And, uh, and you can keep on and going on there because, you know, the source is interesting and somehow... But I don't know. It's also... There is some... You have to adopt a little bit a point of view of iconoclastic point of view, you know? You have to be respectful with this subject. It's what happens for me with opera. You know, I see opera, uh, no, um, the, the, the opera uh, directors, no, um, and you say they are very mo doing very modern and provocative, no, based everything on provocation. But usually, I said, why do you need a provocation 
Why do you need to make this provocation about, with, I don't know, a Mozart opera? Or, you know, who cares? It's like a childish thing. You know, it's, it's really childish. I mean, if you are not interested in the subject of the Da Ponte libretto, why do you choose it? I mean, you can write your own libretto. You can, you know, pick up a composer of nowadays because we are really lacking composers and stage directors of opera that are doing new operas nowadays. No, because all the everything is based in all theaters on repertoire, repertoire. Most, I mean, 90 percent, 95 percent. So we are. Why don't you write a libretto? You know, and you you think about. You no, know, I write my scripts. I just sit down and I write my the scripts of my films. I can write a libretto, but if you use this. Subjects that are important, like in Mozart operas or whoever, no, like I don't know, whatever. Yeah, like Don Quixote. Yeah, like Don Three Quixote Kings. or uh, no? It's because okay, you are a little bit respectful with this iconic part of the thing because if not, choose something else, no. And the provocation will always be cheap. The, in itself, the word provocation, I think it's uh, you know, <laughs> it's a. Uh, Hulebeck <laughs> make a beautiful definition of provocation, saying that provocation is, you know, having an, uh, an interpretation of the reality in your favor. You know, it means that, ah, okay, you interpret something just to be a little bit snobbish and to say, ah, to, for people looking at you, how smart you are or how, you know, intelligent you are compared with the other ones. But this is not, you know, you are not serving the content in itself, if you are referring to something else. You are, you know, taking your own profit on, you know, on your snobbish point of view of that. So, uh, but here you have to be a little bit respectful on, um, on Iconic, and we have, you know, great composers of opera in Germany. So you have to be a little bit respectful of the, of the, of the, the subject you choose. But at the same time, of course, you have to be iconoclast, because if not, uh, what, what is the point of, you know, giving your own vision of that? It has to be something personal. You cannot just be an academic and serve, you know, the thing like, a, you know, you have to feel something that you think, at least, that nobody else feel it the same way or that, you know, that you can develop a little bit. But it's, a, it's, a, it's fragile, this balance, because you can, you can feel in a, in a fake position uh, suddenly because... I felt, I, sometimes it happened to me, in, with this pressure on pushing on myself with this Don Quixote or with Casanova, and I said, I don't have anything. I don't want to have anything to say about that. No, I was putting pressure on myself. But this arrived to a point so radical that I said, fuck, this is true. I mean, this is bullshit. I don't have anything to say. No, really, it because fortunately, my films were done on an organic way with the digital and uh, with three cameras always with you know, I think that quite precise choose of casting uh, in general, I was lucky with that. And okay, something grow up, as I said before, something interesting infiltrate the images in a way that I couldn't even, of course, couldn't even control, but that I couldn't even imagine myself. So I was at the end lucky, but you can be on both sides of the precipice that you are saying too many things that are completely banal, or that you don't have really nothing to say, and that it can be... Uh, and this is the game of the art wall. Another, you know, we're talking about theater, now we go to the art wall. Because art wall, you know, I feel that I, I create a sentence that I think was, that if there is nothing, it can be bad. You know, this is my sentence. So people, in this extreme formalism of, of development of contemporary art, well, I think that this is, and this is, you know, it lacks, you know, materiality in, in a such a, you know, in a, such a degree that you cannot, you cannot even have, have a physical contact with it. So in cinema, fortunately, the images, I don't know, the flow of time, the obligation of having the experience in the same, you know, room with other people, you know, that you cannot stop the thing that, okay, there is something physical. There is something you are inside a frame where inevitably, you know, it cannot be totally empty or, you know, the form will always have some kind of materiality. And I think that for me now it's the only art that interests me. Well, literature, of course, because it's the, the mother of everything. But for the rest, cinema, done a little bit before or months before of having contact with 
people, with the audience, so more freedom. Being, you know, with a camera that can really, some way of, you know, technology that it's capturing things that are really not visible to human eyes. You know, this is a principle, at least in the way I do things. So, so they are really showing the not visible, the unknown. You know, so, and here there is a still a possibility of maybe creating something interesting for the people. Of course, the, the time, no? This on theater, time exists, but uh, I don't know, the, the, experience, the experience of time. There are two or three elements that make cinema, for me now, the most interesting challenge as an artistic so, form. So one, one could say that for an artist today of cinema like you, the reality is first of all a material, which in a way you... you do something with it, you reproduce it, like uh, Michelangelo does it with a marble uh, stone, something like that. But uh, in the same moment, you... Chal the material is complex in this case because it's human beings. Sure. You know, the real material, mostly, because the most important thing in filmmaking, of course, art direction is very important because it's on time at, all the time on the screen, but and also costumes, of course. But the real material that people is really focus when it's watching a film, it's the face of the actors. You know, it's the centrality, inevitably. And, uh, you know, you cannot escape to that. It's very difficult. Uh, you know, the risk is so big of doing something that it's not cinema. But, I mean, just to point it that the most, the, ma the real material of that, of what will have, it's people. Real people with real feelings, with real lives, with real artistic vision, some of them. Even actors, they are not, you know, uh, you know, very in deep with artistic vision, but okay, they are, as they are the, for, the, the front, no, of this vision, the, they are the, represent, the representatives of this vision, I mean, they are smart somehow, they have an intuition, and, but it's people, and I think this makes the thing interesting, and it's also the difference with theater, because in theater you have to repeat things, inevitably, because it's a show, and it has to be more or less, you know, it's every day, and it has to be more or less prepared, of course, we have, been all, we have seen all avant-garde propositions on theater. But, you know, there is some kind of preparation. But in, you know, the power of, you know, something that only happens once in cinema, because the, cap the camera can capture it and it was not even visible to human eyes, this is something that, I mean, it's very powerful to, to really create, uh, have the sensation of something extremely spontaneous that if there is a message there is passing there is a message passing through it you cannot believe it's prepared because the impact of the spontaneity of what you see it's so this is also the power of all cinema even mediocre cinema or or because you believe in the image but when it's really really you know really powerful this effect of spontaneity you can pass everything through it well, you can. It can, because it's not you. Because if you are conscious that you want to pass something through this spontaneity, then, you know, it's, it loses force. It loses, it loses power because it's controlled. So, I don't know. I think there is a lot of possibilities there. And it can be mixed, as I do with professional actors, non-professional actors, locals, international People, I always make people, you know, yeah, you all did, kinds. Uh, you did everything. You did non-professional actors oh. and very professional. I'm from different countries, not speaking sure. the same language. We, we come back in one moment to working with actors, but uh, one step uh, back before about auteur cinema. I think in general, art, for the last 200 years, the general idea of art was to create a new thing, the new, to be avant-garde, and maybe as well to provoke the society or uh, the art history, something like that. Uh, what you were pointing out in the last 10 minutes was that today it is more about taking risks as well as an artist, and sometimes it can be a risk to be really kind of conservative, yeah, to be respectful to a text or to an opera, to a painting, something like that. So um, taking risk as a filmmaker, would you say that this is the main point of auteur cinema, of the European idea of doing cinema? I think yes, and this is obvious in all arts. I mean, if you are taking risk, it means, the definition, I think, of taking risk means that you are doing something you don't understand yourself. 
you are entering a territory, static territory, that you, you really don't, uh, you are in, in the deep of a research, in the deep of, but then, okay, you find the form at the end, no? At the very end, even in the fabrication, in the making of a film, you know, can be after post-production, for example, I don't know, in my, some of my last films, there is a lot of post-production, maybe in Liberty, for example, like 30% of the images were composition of different images and you cannot see and nobody can see it. So it means that the, the meaning arrives at the very end of the stage of the fabrication of the film can arrive, you know, and it changes completely uh, what you are, you are seeing. But imagine, I, I changed 40 or 30 or 40% of the images composed by two different images in the last stage of the making of a film. How this is related of what I was thinking when I was shooting the film? I, I know, I didn't know. I didn't know I would change 40% of the images. I never thought I would change one single image. Of course, I knew that I have some resources here and there, and post-production nowadays is more. I mean, when I say composing different images, it means that it was two images with real people, you know, real actors doing the, the things we shoot, but that they were not exactly in the same space and at the same moment. And the interaction, you know, it's more difficult. And for the reason, it's more fascinating. The meaning, you know, it's, it's even myself, I couldn't understand what I was doing. But apparently, it looks organic and it looks, you know, normal development of, of, of a story in a film. But, you know, taking risk means, okay, in the last film, I mean, first day of shooting one of the actresses, I didn't like the actress, I, I knew before. And so I, I, I realized, and not me, everybody, that it was not, you know, good for the film, the, the, the cho that choice. And then passive fiction. Yeah, yeah, passive yeah passive fiction. fiction. First day of shooting, first five minutes, you know? And, okay, you said, I made a mistake, maybe some producers, whatever. I don't, there is no guilty people. So, what, but we have to move on. And then another actress came in the middle of the shooting in day eight, and she did nice things from day eight to day 12, but then the, she had a discussion with the producer and, and she left a day, uh, there was discussion of money, I don't know, and they, she left at day 14 and sh she shoot something, okay, that was very nice, but not enough to be the main actress of the film or the main character of the film. So we're in day 16 of 25, 20, yeah, 25, without act, main actress, main mm, feminine role. And then somebody else arrives on day 16. And, and this was a genius idea. And this actress of the day 16, that I never thought about her, of course, but because it was a local, and she was there at the beginning of the film, and I, you know, I shoot a little scene as a secondary role, but I saw that she was great. And so I use it as the main actress, and it's the main actress of the film. But to understand that this final decision, uh, it's the best one, I don't know if by chance or not, it's only possible in contemporary cinema taking these risks. You know, if I see something that doesn't work or that I don't know what I want, but I know what I don't want. You know, but it's a. Uh, it's good. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's a, uh, if it's a good or not, but at least you know, you see when you are doing a cliche. So I say, fuck, this is a cliche. No, 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 no. I don't want to get in. No, 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 no. No, and you start to be scared. And because you are doing a cliche or something that somebody else has done or that we all have seen hundreds of times. So, of course, it means that from a static point of view, this has no value, you know, to come back to a cliche. So if I, you know, I really feel that I am inside a cliche, then I start shivering and, okay, what I have to do to be a, to, uh, to do something interesting? I don't know. So... But how so then, you mean, the risk was this one. Who can accept changing the actress three times during a shooting in a, you know, in a three million film? It's not that common. I mean, I will say. And the producers were cursing you, uh, probably. Well, I mean, it was, was not easy. But it was not easy for anybody. I mean, so some, somehow, and this is another interesting thing, because I always like to, to work with crazy actors, but actors take risks if they see that you also take risks as a filmmaker, or the, if they see that the producer are also taking risks on their own job, you know, then actors become more, you know, and not about complaining, I just wanting to do, you know, very typical things. You know, they really want to get in sometimes into unexplored territories where they really, you know, challenge themselves, 
you know, with some things they have never done before or, or you know, from trying, I don't know, an actor that is very serious, you know, uh, sometimes if it's, you know, if it's really in this frame of taking risk can do a grotesque comedy, you know, it's a challenging thing for him. He's at risk of losing his image of a serious actor that is only doing, but sometimes, I don't know, we all like, you know, films that are, you know, a little bit of harsh comedies or whatever, you know, it's also necessary and we have, we have a great tradition of expressionist, harsh, you know, caricatures of something, some aspects of our world. So why not? Or whatever, or explicit sex, for example, you know, it's not that common that, you know, famous actors can get in in explicit sex, you know, because they feel more vulnerable and they don't like this kind of vulnerability. Everybody feels more vulnerable naked than, you know, dressed. So, but okay, they can accept it if everybody is taking, you know, similar or parallel risk. And fortunately, as you told me at the beginning about producer, I was lucky of always finding nice people in this sense. So, avoiding the cliché, um, how do you communicate when that is happening? Because, as actors are very vulnerable, you have to find a good way not to make them even more insecure. Yeah. So, do, you don't say to them, oh, fuck, I don't like this. Uh, you, you are, are you shooting and repeating a lot? Are you a tender director? Or how do you speak uh, with actors? I think I found a good solution for that. Because, as you said, it's a, it's, a, it's a crucial problem. I mean, and, and I found that the best way was not to communicate at all. Because, yes, it because I don't, I don't like to communicate with actors in general, but specifically, I don't communicate if never. And I never repeat things. If they do something I like, I never ask them to repeat it or never congratulate them. And if they do things I don't like, I never tell them that I don't like and I never repeat them. So the key point was not communicating and shooting the film as a performance. Everything only happens once. Insecurity. You create insecurity not as well. Not insecurity. It depends because they get used to it. Uh, okay. And okay, the first day you feel a little bit insecure. You are always in, in, the, in a vulnerable territory, but not because of this lack of communication or because of me, because of the three cameras with zoom lenses. They don't know the zoom. They, don't, they know. don't know the camera. So the main vulnerability is this one. But, I mean, if I don't say anything, for me, it's, everything is fine because I take it as a performance, like in a contemporary art. Everything will happen once, and it has to be memorable, and it has to be unique. And I don't care if it's good or bad, but I care if it happens once. I only care about that. I don't want repetitions. And okay, you can do wrong things, because you cannot be genius, you know, with the, with the shooting of 500 hours of rushes, or 600 hours, or, uh, you know, with three cameras, okay, 200 hours of sound, uh, you know, you cannot be genius um, as an actor or perfect, you know, it's impossible. In fact, if you were perfect in these 200 hours, the film will last 200 hours. And I always said, if the film is 2 hours 45, it's because I don't have one single image to add. I mean, all the rest is bullshit. You know, this is the final film, and, uh, you know, it's the fragility of it, it's that if they ask me with a gun that they have to, you know, put f five minutes more, I would say, I'm sorry, you have to kill me, I can. Because I don't have anything as good as that, so I will destroy the thing. So, but the, the, the idea is, okay, actors also enter in this mood, no, of, you know, of non-communication, Good for them. For the reason I even prefer them not to read the script. And only one or two actors in all my career read the script of my films, in fact. So, uh, and if I explain something, usually it's never during the shooting. Sometimes I can talk with actors, but I try to avoid it during the shooting because you have, you know, too much direct uh, uh, influence. Yeah, but but on some, the some, 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 you, you worked with some very great actors of auteur cinema, like Benoit Magimel yes, in yes. your last film, or Jean Pierre Leo in The Death of. Louis XIV, so I guess you have to meet them before and at least yeah. tell them what is your general idea. Yes, but I don't know. It, it, most, of this time, most of the time it's a matter of trust, you know, and these people, it's okay, sometimes or often well-chosen people in the sense that they are rock and roll, that they are a little bit open-minded, that they are 
you know, that they like to do different things, that if they are there, it's not to, I don't know, it's to give something, not to receive something, you know? So, like me, you know, I am there to give something to, you know, or to try something. But if I, you know, I don't do it for myself because I don't know if the result will be nice or not so nice. Of course, I have a little bit of confidence and I want the thing to arrive to a point that it's in itself original, but I don't know. And if, I mean, what I said, if you take the risk is because you want them to also take this uh, similar risk. But they were nice. And of but course, they are shocked, but it's only the first days, then... They but, adapt. but how do you judge that uh, an actor is interesting for you? Because on one hand, one could say that Jean Pierleau, Helmut Berger, and as well Magimel, in a different way, they bring a lot of work and the voices of other auteur filmmakers with them. Yes. And uh, of course, in a way, you use it. Uh, and you maybe you want the audience to think as well of other roles of Leo or so. And on the other hand, you want to bring them in a situation where they don't think and just act and perform. So where they lose all this experience. What is it what makes an actor interesting for you that you say, okay... It's very difficult and it's almost, I would say, impossible to say it during the shooting. Because the, the things that capture my, the way I shoot, that, that my cameras capture, you cannot see it with your human eyes there. Of course, you have confidence that the actor, globally, it's, a, it's good and it's a good bet. You did a good bet. You think that and you feel something and of course. But you are never in a safe territory, a completely safe territory in this. Uh, for the reason, for example, when I am dubious with casting, and I, this I did it in all my films, I use two people doing the same role. And I shoot most of, most of the scenes or most of the film with the two actors in order to, of course, not the same, exactly the same as scenes because maybe I want to keep both, or, but just to have resources that if one is not that good, I will have the other one that it's, uh, you know, better. And this I have done it in all my films, even in Pacifiction, in a lot of, I mean, it's natural for me and to repeat similar scenes with different people or similar dialogues with an, in a totally different context, you know, with other actors, and to say, because all the actors are available all days of the shooting, and I decide every morning which actor will act. Of course, the main actors, the, you know, Machinelle, Machinelle has yeah. to be there every day, but the others, no. And this is very interesting because you can really feel the, the mood of the people. As I said, you work with human beings, not machines. No? So it means that everyone has its own mood that day. So it's a little bit like a football coach as well, where you have to... No, keep because everyone. I don't, I don't <laughs> talk to them. And I mean, in fact, I don't, I don't care about the final result because it's not visible and it's too uncertain, the final result. So it's very difficult to coach anything because you don't know the way. You are living the way, well, the, the way you are living this, you know, this, 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 this journey while you are doing it. And... I don't have anything to say to them. Yes, when I don't like something, I don't tell them, but I try to avoid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's the only thing I do, basically. So so far in all your films, uh, the, the main person is a male person. I know that it will change in your next film, uh, I guess so. Will you, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? No, well, I don't know. <laughs> It's a new film in English with American actors, and uh, yeah, the, ma the main character is a, is a female character, and I don't know. But this, I am totally, you know, at the beginning I worked with non-professionals. Then I started working with professionals and I didn't see, I didn't feel any difference the way I, I shoot, you know. If you choose the right people, I don't see. I shoot with old people, with young people, uh, with animals. I didn't see any difference. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, with explicit sex, with more intellectual content, I did, I did it the same way. I, you know, male, uh, women character. I don't see. Sincerely, I, 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 I don't. You know, it's, uh, oh, it's every person, every element that requires an, an a special treatment, but not because of being old or famous or not famous. You know. 
Okay, it's your personality, the personality of the actor that requires my attention, my care, my, you know, my observation, maybe my insightful, a little bit aggressive, insightful, you know, approach. But uh, because as, a, as an individual, not as a part of any, and I really, when you shoot this way, with the three cameras, with the zoom lenses, everybody's the same. You know, everybody's entering the same vulnerability. I can tell you, there is no, it's very difficult for an actor, you know, to control, to, to keep the control of, of his own or her own image. It's impossible. So everybody, it's like, and I, I experiment that in a very beautiful way in Liberté, that you know that it's a cruising area, cruising, typical cruising sex area, uh, where everybody is the same. You know, there is no, no I don't know, uh, handsome people and ugly people. There is no more old or young. There is no more rich and poor. There is no anything, you know, these cruising areas. You know, the key point is that everybody is the same. You know, so it's more about giving than receiving. So but more about, you know, acting than judging. So, uh, but I did the film because it was explicit sex and I never did things with explicit sex or not at this level. So I said, well, we'll see what happens here because it's not that obvious that, you know, you can do these things in a realistic way, organic, at the same time with fantasy, at the same time that it's poetic, you know, but at the same time that has to be a little bit rough, you know, as, as life. Uh, so, and then as I adopt the same attitude with the, that in a cruising area, somehow everything magically, I don't, don't explain me uh, why, because we shoot at night and I still don't know how the film was, was shot, but uh, magically I think that the attitude of myself taking everything at the same level and all the elements of the film. Uh, this is a, a Godard teaching, you know. There is no hierarchy between elements of the film, as there is no hierarchy between actors. Because, okay, an actor that is a secondary actor but appears less time, of course, it's less time, but in itself, that moment is unique for him. So it, it has to be at the same level as the, the, the actor that is more time there, because time in itself is unique, you know, every time. So, so I think that this idea of, of, of non-communication, of having all, everybody, every element at the same level, no hierarchy, no, no control on, you know, pretending to be smarter than the film or even smarter than the, you know, or knowing more about, you know, the actors themselves. Sometimes they miss that because actors are so used to be in a frame where the director, you know, guides them and they need that. And for this reason, you know, sometimes they miss, but they get used very easily. And I think that the key point of Liberté was this one, that it was, the, the film itself, it was a cruising area. Yeah. Okay, I have some more questions, but I'm sure that you have as well. So uh, you are allowed to ask in German, of course. Um, wenn Sie Fragen möchten oder Anmerkungen, wir haben auch ein Mikrofon im Saal, there is a microphone. Please give a sign, hier vorne. Ähm, bringt das jemand von euch? Ja, genau, danke. Ähm, hier vorne, zweite Reihe, hier drüben, da? Ja, genau, pardon. Uh, you mentioned that you're interested in the unknown, especially like working with digital cameras. And I could see that at some points in your fil for film, for example, like Liberté or Pacifixion where you had like uh, some kind of conspiracy or something hidden, like uh, in a political context, for example. But could you more elaborate on that, what you see in the unknown, or like especially regarding uh, working with, with digital cameras? Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting point because it's obvious that, I mean, if you have a super structure script from dramatic point of view, where the subject of the film is very visible, yeah, it's more difficult to make it really mysterious. I am not saying that it's impossible. And in fact, it's a new challenge. And in my new film, there is still a part of, of flu or a part of on the, on the plot. But I try to go more on concrete on the plot itself, eh? especially on the drama of the thing. But I don't know if it's possible. Because when you get, when everything on the, on the content of the film, it's, all, it's not obvious, but it's visible, then what else remains? This is the main question. What else? If there is not, a, you know, 
a content that is floating but that is not there, of course, every content, you know, activates your imagination, but some content activates more, some content less. And I don't know how to deal with something where you have a clear message to say or a clear drama to show. I don't know how to do it with images nowadays. I, myself, it's not my style. I don't know how to deal with that. I need, or at least I, I try to reduce every, in every film this, no, not in Liberté because it was pure extract, abstraction, but, uh, uh, but okay, that was the concretion of con concrete element of the bodies. So, but I don't know how to make a political, how to make a political film with a very, you know, controlled and, you know, a structured drama, you know, structure without can keeping the mystery, uh, without saying something that it's already said before the image appear, or that it's, it's always appearing seconds before it appears. Because drama, you know, it's what drama do, does. And for the reason when you have, you know, little screens, you know, like mobile phones and on platforms that they want you to see films everywhere, you know, in the mobile or while traveling in the iPad or wherever, you know, they use drama a lot because at least you get something very fast and very concrete and reliable that it's, in, you know, but if, I don't know, maybe it's too much. I, I try to reduce, I try, it's the new challenge of new cinema, I think, or the cinema of the future. How to make really compatible the inner mystery of images with some kind of more, every time, more and more, you know, structure content where the, 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 the fog is less obvious, where you don't really, you know, you don't really use it as a tool of making the film mysterious, where mystery can really be, you know, inside every, everything, even a conventional plot. And this is the point. Um, I don't know, we'll see next film because I will work with English, in English, what I don't like very much, and especially with English actors. But, uh, so I think that they, have, they come from different backgrounds. And we'll see, maybe, you know, my goal was this one. You see, well, let's see if my system works with people naked. My system works with professional actors. My system works in, in French cinema, because at the beginning I only did, you know, cinema in my, in, in my yeah, in Catalan and in Spain. So let's see now if it works and we can reduce or we can can really have a mystery that, you know, it's at the, t at the same time, you know, mysterious, but at the same time extremely concrete. We because it's, pr problem it's sensuality, you know, because when, it, when it's more, you know, inevitably when you play with elements, with a little bit of sensual feeling, I mean, with the sound, with the images, with the cinematography, art direction, whatever, you know, mise en scène, Okay, everything becomes less concrete in sense because it's like a, it's like a visual or like a sensitive experience. So you inevitably you lose a little bit the connection with the plot or with the dramatic structure because it's so well done. The sensuality of the uh, the sound and visual elements, and then okay, the sensation that arrives to you at the end it's more sensuality than concrete, concrete, you know, structure of, of drama. How to make it as, you know, as, how to make it more, you know, to, to really be together. It's, dif it's difficult. And we'll see. We will see. Is, are there more questions or remarks from your side? Yes, please. Nochmal Handzeichen, let's see. Um, I would like to know if you use screenplays at all for your productions, or do you work uh, what? based on screenplays? Screenplays, screenplays, screenplays. Uh, uh, scripts. Yes. Written, written dialogues, um, or do you, you or are you just working based on on treatments? Yes. Because in Pacific Fiction, I couldn't really figure out how you, how you, how the shooting process relates to the existence even of a something like a screenplay. Yeah. I mean, if you end up with uh, 500, 600 hours mm -hmm. of rushes, it's quite uh, interesting well, to, yeah. yeah. 
Well, I use it because I have a script, because nowadays for finance you need a script. And more or less a it change from film to film. But in general, more or less conventional scripts, uh, you know, have to submit, deliver. This plot and dialogue yes, and yes. so on. Uh, I found in recent films my own specific way of doing it, that it, it doesn't include, uh, it includes uh, dialogues, but not in first person, in third person like in a novel. So the whole, you know, what they say that you don't have to do in a script, that it's explaining what the characters think and, you know, what, um, what they want to say and they don't say, or what, you know, they say that in a script, the rule is that you only have to describe, you know, and put the sentence that you will see on the screen, only what is visible, you know, on a screen. This is, I don't know why, but the rule of a script. But why I have to follow the rule if no actor will read the script, you know, the script, as they, nobody else will read it except the production people, uh, it's for me. I, I write it for me, not for them, because they will do whatever, whatever they had to do, but because I will, you know, I will say what they have to do or where they have to sit or where, which clothes they have to wear or what sentence they have to say if I want to communicate with them. But, uh, uh, I mean... In, and in this last Pacifiction, for example, there was a lot. It was, and the next film, it's very, very long script because it's like a novel. It's like 100 pages, but without, you know, without uh, direct uh, di dialogues on direct style. So it means that every page is full of lines. I mean, it's like a novel, and it takes more time to read. And it's not, you know, in general for finance, it's not very good because people that are in commissions. You know, they want fasting and they have to write a lot of scripts and this one it's more heavy and it's a little bit more baroque, we will put it, because it's half description of what the characters think, half description of what they say, half description of what they want to say. Well, like a novel, a little novel. And, but this is very, I don't know, it's useful for me and it was, uh, I don't know, I get in the atmosphere of the film better than if I just, you know, write functional dialogues. I can do it, and in fact, they are right on most of the dialogues of the of the film. But in th in third in third person dialogues for me in a script, they are less less vulgar because you skip a lot of quotidian things. I can concentrate only in the you know in the poetic you know in the poetic gesture of language, you know because if you write somebody that gets uh, here. And you write, hello, good morning. The other character say, hello, good morning, how are you? This is totally stupid, you know? You read this in the script and you, you want to close it and, you know, but it's what, yeah, we will see this on the image, of course, because if somebody enters in a room, we'll say hello to somebody, because if it's on the stars and people say hello and shake hands in the discotheque at the beginning because somebody is arriving, this is normal, totally natural, and it's part of the images. But to see this written in a script, I mean, it's so boring that you even imagine of a, that you start thinking about a film school or a student that don't know anything about cinema or, you know, or a, so, I don't know. Also, this sensation for me was very, was very, very strong and I wanted to avoid this while, while writing. And so I said, I will skip this and I will only concentrate on dialogues in third person so you can, you can find the form that it's a little bit more elegant and more suggestive, you know, because it's not the strict quotidian dialogue that then the characters, of course, will deliver in the shooting because they will not talk as if they were in a novel, no, or if they were in, a, I don't know, in a play of the 16th century. But uh, uh, there is, I don't know, it's a little bit more balanced and it's also he helpful for me because it reminds me the direction of the poetic flow of the content of the dialogues, where it has to go, which words are important, you know, not what they say, uh, you know. For me, there was a magic example of power, and I, I, I talk about this anecdote very often, but I think it, it's worth to, to repeat it again, it's very, very short. It's in the book of, that I don't like the filmmaker a lot, Jean-Pierre Melville, you know, in the, I think it's with uh, Noel Sim Solo, or I don't remember with who is doing conversation. But he was a great cinephile, and he explains that he was talking with a friend one day, and he said that, ah, oh, do you remember they were talking about the Magnificent Ambersons by Orson Welles? So they, they were said, ah, oh, there was a, 
you know, that the scene that there was a, the, the field of cotton, you know, behind, and there is this beautiful scene of dancing with the fields of cotton on the background, and, you know, and the friend tells him, tells him, which fields of cotton? I don't remember this scene. He said, of course, it's the most beautiful scene of the film, Jean-Pierre Melville sa says himself. You know, that they are there dancing with, you know, several, you know, like in a party, and uh, you see the films on. Okay, the other guy said, wow, fuck, I don't, I don't remember this scene, whatever. Okay, then, you know, life goes on, and one day, Jean-Pierre Melville said, fuck, why is said, you know? And so he, because at that time, of course, there was no DVD or VHS or anything, so the chance you had to see again the film was... So ten time passed, and so he shows the film again, and he realizes that there is no scene with cotton fields, but there is a scene where they are dancing and they are talking about cotton fields. So in his, in his mind, he creates the image of them. So this is the power of suggestive power of, of language, spoken language in filmmaking that I think it's forgotten sometimes, because some words are already poetic, and they create an image behind. You don't need decor. They create the decor, you know, because you cannot watch the film and hear this word without that this word interferes in your imagination and creates a whole visual wall, wall around. you around, it means around what you are really seeing, but what you are really, you know, projecting in your imagination. And it's simply, you know, a, a word. You know, they're cotton fields, you know. They, were, they are talking about where they will collect because it's the, the film is in the south of the U.S., I think, yes. or something like that. So, you know, but without seeing it. So I, sometimes I say, why people have spent so many money, you know, putting these complex decors behind? They just have to talk about it and it will be, the image will be in the mind of all the, all the spectators and it will cost zero money, so, you know. As we have to come to the end, I want to close with a very uh, short question and a short answer, if possible, um, because uh, you told us you will shoot with American actors, actresses, your next film, but in Europe. So, uh, what is, in your opinion, uh, speaking as an artist, in terms of art, not politics so much, but it comes together, what is the relationship between The, the old world, Europe, and the new world, America. In a way, years ago, many years ago, America was the point where many Europeans fled to. It was refugee land. Now, it's kind of the different way. Many Americans, liberal Americans, come to cities like Barcelona or Berlin to be free in their art and in their right of expression. Yes, because it's simpler. The, 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 you describe it perfectly. It's the opposite movement. Because here we have public money that you don't have to give back. That's the point. Very simple. You know, so you can do things that as cinema it's a little bit expensive. You can do things with public money as they do in opera or in theater, by the way, you know, in a more, even more exaggerated way, uh, that, you know, you have the freedom. And because if you have to give the money back, the totality of the money you spend You will, be, you will be obliged to make a very commercial film. And your Because film? even an art house film, it's expensive. It will cost you, I don't know, of course you can do a film for 200,000 euros or even less, you know, but uh, with good quality of sound and everything. But if not, it will cost you more than a million. So in your new film, you, with European money, you give work to poor American actors. Yes. And you're telling a story of a Russian actors artists. also. Ah, Russian. Russia. So it's America, Russia. Yes, it's and a film Europe about the, is the battlefield, or what is Europe? Yes, yes, Europe is in the middle, and unfortunately, we are the victims of uh, of that. But not the victims because we are the ones that are creating the film. So, but I mean, in politics, maybe now we are not in a good position. But uh, no, yes, it's uh, I don't know. Everything is possible in, in European cinema, and we are showing it more than ever. Yes. Because all the people in the U.S., you know, I talk with art house filmmakers in the U.S., and they are all desperate. But really, and well, I mean, and everything is so money focused, and it's such an expensive country. You know, you go to nowadays, you go to New York, and it's unbelievable how expensive is everything. Uh, I mean, real life. And you go to L.A., and it's the same. The big cities and and all these filmmakers, they cannot even afford to. 
you know, unless you go to a platform and you do what the platform, you know, says you have to do, you know, and you accept the conditions and then you are fine. But you are fine. But if not, you cannot do. It's very difficult to make a real independent or creative project there. And we don't see that much. I think the only example, the only, the only filmmaker I just watch, and not, not all the films because it's very, you know, irregular sometimes, but that I really, you know, somehow I admire what he is doing is Tarantino. Because he's really taking incredible risk and doing crazy things. And I don't know how, but he became an industry you know, leader or a standard and he's being successful, some films more, some films less, but it's doing also, it's challenging all the time inside the, the heart of Hollywood and the heart of America and, and renovating the thing from inside. But apart from him, I don't see anybody else, you know, doing this and people have to simply move, I don't know, go away or simply, you know, live a sad, live a sad life, you know, working for, for platforms. And, uh, you know, uh, so next time we will analyze Hollywood cinema a bit more and in between we will see hopefully two of your new films. One is that you were talking about and before there will be a Very documentary <laughs> or essay yeah. on Corrida. Yes, and bullfighting. Well, Corrida, Spanish Corrida, it's a documentary following Juan Torero. And, uh, well, everybody is a little bit because it's ultra violent. I think they do should sell it, the most violent film of the last, you know, the 10 years. But, wow. you know, people said, what are you doing this corrida? And I said, fuck, I am putting the camera. I am not the, the one who is doing the, the show. I mean, I, am just, I don't care about the fucking show. You know, I am just there shooting. Or everybody in the war has to be, you know, there is doctors in the war, no, that uh, they are not, uh, you know, killing people. They are saving people. And it's a war. You know, so I am the one, who, or there are journalists also in war, no? and yeah. they are not killing anybody, not because you are there as a journalist or as a doctor, you are part of the, of the show of the war. I mean, no. So I said, well, calm down, you know, I am just, you know what, watching it and recording it with the camera. It's But like, it's a little bit, you know, and, but for, and this is the interesting point, because it's the beginning of the end. I feel of bullfighting because new society in you know, our society of nowadays, you know, this visibility of death and of, of suffering and of suffering of animals, I think it's not something that will, will be tolerated, you know, much more or that it's a declining, you know, concept. So I think it's, it's good to, to have this last, uh, I don't know, last uh, recording of something. Yeah, so it is like uh, in The Quiet American of Graham Greene, there is the sentence, I'm just a reporter, I report what I see. So you are the quiet Catalan, yeah. you report what you see. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it's Thank true. Thank you very it's, much. Uh, yeah, true. I, Thank I, you very Godard much. Said, Godard, Godard said, you have to be focused on what is in front of the camera, not what is behind. This is your own ideas, your own projections. No, no. What Godard is in front? Is always right. Yes. We know. Yes. It's like Oscar Wilde. It's a very yes, ingenious person, but that at Borges said of Oscar Wilde, he was very ingenious, but he was also always right. So, not provocation no. in his case. Yeah. You know, was no. just saying, telling the no. truth in a beautiful way. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>